So cool. Um, wait, before we start, I wanted to ask you, um, are you, are you, you're not playing at the moment, obviously, because of this whole situation, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, you're, so, still, uh, you're still signed with, like, currently I'm a free agent. Oh, really? Yeah. So, I mean, I can, I'll go over my story, but I'll tell you, like, when our season ended in October, um, yeah. they, the, cause I, I signed a one year contract with the club from January until the season ended in October. And when the season ended, like I, I did pretty well. I played about like a third, almost like half the games. And um, for my first year, like I did pretty well, got on, you know, and started a couple games. And so my meeting like end year with the coach, um, basically he was like, look, there's three players that we might be able to bring back. And you're one of those three, like, most guys, he either told them, like, we want you back or, like, we don't want you back. And then there was, like, three guys that he was, like, I'm not sure about, and I was one of them. So then he was just like, look, um, I'll keep in touch. I'll tell you, like, in two weeks, I'll tell you, you know, what our decision is, and we'll go from there. So I was like, perfect. All right, let me know. Two weeks happened. Still hadn't heard from him. Man, like, a month later, uh, it was, like, maybe three weeks, a month later, I got just a message from the club director and it was like my uh, my termination, basically my like sign these papers, and you know we're not going to bring you back. And it, it man, it was kind of an unfortunate situation because I never even heard from the coach. I just got an email that said like, "Hey, sign this," and so that you can have your release. And so I ended up talking with the coach. Obviously, that he didn't want me, but it's just kind of shady how it went down. But then I became a free agent right then, like middle of November. And then I started like looking for clubs, like went on like two different trials and like had multiple connections and then like nothing was coming up, man. And then March hit and uh, like this, this whole thing started, right? Like end of February, 1st of March with like the whole coronavirus. And I mean, you know, like all the leagues shut down and blah, blah, blah. So uh, I was like still looking, still a free agent right when it happened. And then I would spend, I guess two months of nothing and uh i don't know we'll see the uh it's looking like most of the clubs will get back in july but by then this season like because you're supposed to end in october yeah i mean I don't know if they'll they're gonna have to shorten the schedule and like the playoffs is gonna be weird so i don't know about this year how it's gonna like work out for everybody but at least for me right now i'm free agent currently that's tough man i, I mean that that must be tough and, um, yeah. yeah i was like, i was like sh- pretty confident that he was going to bring me back because i had done really well my first year and then it looked like it, looked like it too from the outside uh, yeah like i got messages from guys that were just like they really thought too. They're like, bro, why did they not sign you again? All this kind of stuff. And I think ultimately it was just the coach and uh, just the way he manages and stuff. And anyway, I was grateful for the year that I got, but yeah. we're moving on. Yeah. Damn. Okay. Um. So shall we start? By the Let's way, do- that remind that reminds me a lot of. Uh, my own story, except mine was, <laughs> I was an international, so it was like just looking for anything, man, like looking for opportunities. And you know how the whole thing goes. Yeah. Anyway, okay. So welcome, welcome, Matthew Rogers, to, uh, to the Bigger Than Football podcast. Thank and you. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for for letting us in on your story. I feel like it's going to really inspire some of the young students that we have in our program um, and even just other professionals um, that are around you um, and around me. Um, so thank you. Thank you for, for being a part of this. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, I think a, a good place to start would be um, where you are right now, you know, um, where, you have, where you have been playing. Um, you, you're in Tulsa. You've been playing for the Tulsa Roughnecks in the USL um, as a professional footballer. Um, uh, and, and what kind of place are you in right now? Yeah. So, uh, just recently in October, uh, finished my first year as a professional player. 
uh, with the Tulsa Roughnecks, which now uh, they recently changed their name to FC Tulsa. So sometimes people will get confused, but they've got a new name. But anyway, um, played a full season with them. Amazing experience. My journey to get there was probably way different than most people and how kind of it played out uh, was kind of unconventional. And if I had to think about the way that it went down, I would have probably done it differently, but I was grateful for, for the year um, that I was playing with them. Um, and I loved every minute of it. So it was really, really awesome. So how about you take us back to, let's not even go back to before you joined the team, but um, where your development journey really started. Um, let's say when you first started to be passionate about football to the point where you were like, this is something I want to take seriously. When do you think that moment came for you? Oof. I was really young. I mean, because my story, I, I started playing when I was probably three or four. And as soon as I came, one of my earliest memories, um, I started playing and I just, I loved, I loved to go out there and play. Like it was any moment that the bell rang and we could go out there. I was the first one out there. First one out the door, I didn't care. I was kicking a ball around, doing whatever I want. I just wanted to move. I just like couldn't sit still, wanted to go out there and play. So I remember all of these memories just kicking around with friends in the playground and then obviously really loving it. And then it wasn't until middle school or high school that I was like, I really like I, this is all I want to do. Like I, my favorite sport, nothing else I want to do. I have the most fun and I was like decently good. So uh, that made it so much more fun for me. And um, then I took it from there and then college really was like if I had to say like a passion. Before we get to college, right? Before we okay. get to college, you, you were in Mexico at the time, right? Growing up. Were yes. you playing academy? Were you just playing for, you know, uh, the school team or, or what kind of setup did you have? Yeah, so it's really funny because when we moved there, my parents didn't know anything about football or how everything works, right? Like, looking back on it, now we know that, you know, there's academies and there are, you know, the pro players come from all the best teams and they start them at a super young age. Well, for me, I didn't know any of that, neither did my parents. And so me as a four, five, six-year-old, seven-year-old just kind of getting started um, and even going into first grade, I just, I just went out there and played because I thought it was fun. So I never once from first grade to 12th grade played academy i just played high school uh which yes. most people in the states they're like you can't just play high school you got to play club well for me even in mexico the level was like pretty high for high school uh way higher than i mean u.s high schools if you had to compare um and then like the pro caliber players were playing for the clubs but we didn't know any better so they didn't they didn't think like oh we should probably he's pretty good we should probably put him in a club and let him develop they just like oh yeah play um play for your school every every year so that's what i did from middle school all the way on i just played for my school and um i mean it was i just didn't know any better but i loved it um but then as the years passed, i was like okay i need to kind of take this to the next level yeah did did you when you when you moved back to America, was it something that your your family had planned, or was it just like okay now you know all these you know the school you were going to, the teammates you were playing with, it was just like okay we're gone now. Was that planned or just happened? Uh, it it kind of just happened. I knew about uh, ninth grade freshman year. I knew like okay I I, I want to play this in college. Like for sure, four years away, I want to play in college. I think I'm good enough. And by my junior year, two years later, I was going to camps, all that kind of stuff. Um, but I, I, I just didn't know enough about how it all worked. So I thought, okay, I'll email the coaches. I'll just show up to the camp and hopefully something will happen. Um, and my parents at the same time didn't know any better of, hey, you need to be doing these steps to get there. And so when the time came, when I graduated high school, I had – I was just so behind. I had no real prospects. Nobody was really scouting me because I lived in Mexico because I was so far away and I didn't play at a high enough club. You know, no one's going to come watch your high school games, you know, from, from the United States to scout you, right? Like that just doesn't happen, but I didn't know any better. So I just thought, okay, I'll go, um, my junior summer, I'll go to these camps and then hopefully it'll work. Well, I chose some of the best camps in the country. I went to Michigan state, like, 
yeah. top quality players. I mean, amazing program. And I did well, but obviously at the time, uh, didn't make an impression for them to make an offer. And so I kept on going to these really good camps and was like, man, I'm getting blown out of the water. These guys are good because I hadn't, you know, seen that level at all. And, um, and I kind of went from there, but I, I knew I wanted to play my freshman year. Uh, I just didn't know how to, how to get there. Yeah. That is, you know, that is, that is, that's one thing I find so fascinating about your story is the fact that you didn't do all the things that, um, that you're supposed to do. You know, you didn't have, you didn't have the highlight video, you know, you didn't have the, you didn't have the, <laughs> it's so crazy, man. I did, uh, I did everything wrong. I was, I was talking to someone the other day. It's like, if I, if I could look back at myself in those years and being like, oh yeah, I want to go play in college. And then, you know, myself now looks back at me. I would have laughed and I, I would have, it's like, you would you know, you told the little kid, like, you know, like, all right, be quiet. Like, that's how I felt because I just did everything wrong. And I was just like, I would, I would have felt bad for myself if I could look back now. Of how I was like, yeah, I want to go play at a, a division one school in the United States of America. And I had nothing done at the right way. Uh, yeah. It's so funny. So now you, you graduate, you graduate high school. And, and um, I mean, whether you, you, you go back to the United States immediately or what was, what was the plan after that? So <laughs> it's funny. In my head, when I graduated high, uh, high school, I said, I'm going to go play college in, in the United States. I don't know how it's going to happen, but I'm going to the United States. And I'm, at some point, I'm going to play for um, college soccer. And I had applied to different schools. I had applied to Michigan State because I have family in Michigan. I applied to a, a team in California. I had applied to ORU because my sisters went there. So that was the only reason that I applied there. My sisters went there. And I was like, okay, I'll just apply there, whatever. And then I applied to like all these different places. And in my mind, I was just like, I don't know how it's going to happen, but in May I graduate. And in August, I'm going to the United States and I'm going to make it happen. And so right when around graduation, I found out that I had gotten accepted to a couple ones and, um, I had reached out and again, nothing, you know, you know how it is. You send an email to a coach, they've got 10,000 emails. They're not going to respond to you. And I was like, Hey, you know, I want to come here and no one responded. And so when it came to the point where I was like, I need to make a decision on where I'm going to go to college. Uh, I was like, okay, I feel that I did research and found out that ORU had division one. Then in my mind, I was like, I'm not playing anything else than Division One. I. I was a classic 18 year old that's like, I'm playing D1 sports. Um, yeah. And I basically told them, um, I told ORU, I was like, hey, I'm, um, I'm going to come to the university, kind of committed, but had nothing with soccer. Like, I just told the admissions office, like, you know, count me and I'm going to be there in the fall. But I hadn't even really talked to the coaches. And so I had a really funny story about how, um, I think it was that May when I graduated. You know how they did college weekend? Basically, all the people come and they can get an idea of what it's like. I showed up on campus to see, like, okay, what's it like here? And I ended up walking up and knocking on the door of the uh, ORU soccer coach at the time, Steve Hayes. I know you, I know you remember Steve Hayes. Hey. And I knocked on his door and I said, hi, my name is Matt Rogers. I want to come here and play soccer. And hey. I mean, he handled it well, but like anybody that does that, you, you don't know who that player is. You don't know where they played. Like everybody has a dream of playing, you know, you don't really trust just what they say. And so he kind of gave me a, okay, like, sounds good. If you ended up coming in the fall, like reach out to me again, you know, we can see. And so I was like, cool. I, that's all I needed to hear. He was like, cool. I'll see you in the fall. Right. So I left his office and ended and up. In his head, in his head, he's probably thinking like, I don't even. I mean, where does this guy even play? Like, no, like he's who? Laughing at me. Like he, he's literally laughing at me and being like, who, "Oh my gosh, poor kid!" Like he was probably like, "Oh, yeah. poor kid!" Like he thinks he can just walk in and play Division One because <clears throat> he's. I mean, he's thinking about. He's already got his guys months ago for the next season, right? Yeah. That's really late to be bringing guys in anyway. So he's already got a bunch of his guys. Um, he's already got his plan for the next year because it. The season was only a couple months away. It hits right in August. So, but looking back on it, I can think what he thought of me at the moment. But in my mind, I'm, I'm like, oh, this is perfect. I love, you know, he's, he's expecting me back in the fall. Um, it's going to be awesome. 
And so uh, fast uh, forward in, to August, I am on campus. We're about, it was probably like August 15th ish, right around when school started. And I was in the aerobic center where um, everybody comes in and there's like basketball courts, there's all this kind of stuff. (laughs) The funniest thing, I'm playing basketball with a friend and I see the two, I see the head coach and the assistant coach walk by and I walk up to him and I say, Hey, my name is Matt Rogers. We met in May. I go here now. And I want to try out for your team. And yeah. at the time, <laughs> they, they, I didn't know this, but the guys show up early August. Like everybody has to be there early August. And I think that was your first year. Like they tell you, hey, you have to be you first. Missed the whole of you Yeah, missed I, the whole of- I stole of it. I had no idea. I had no idea that you guys are the first ones on campus and that uh, you need to be there, you know, two weeks before that so that you go through the whole preseason and then the season starts end of August. Well, I didn't know that because, again, I don't know anything. So I tell him, I say, hey, I want to try out for the team. And he looks at me and looks at the assistant. He's like, okay, we're probably going to have tryouts next week. I'm like, perfect. Give him my email. He's like, I'll email you, blah, blah. And so sure enough, man, two weeks later, I don't know if you were there that day, but two weeks later I showed up and they had sent out a whole thing and about 30 guys showed up. They wanted to try out. And it was kind of interesting how they did it. They brought half the team in. They were like actual on the team and kind of to play and just do like a little scrimmage to kind of see the level. And that yeah. day out of – there's probably 30, 40 guys. They picked two of us, and I was one of them. And he basically just told me – he didn't even tell me I was on the team. He was just like – it was Will Rivera. I don't know if you remember Will. Yeah. But he – he was just like, hey, just come to practice. Like, didn't say I was on the team. He was like, you're invited to practice. And, man, that, I mean, I still remember where I was when I got that phone call. And I was like, perfect. So next day I showed up to practice, and it was it was funny, man, because I knew <laughs> – I didn't tell you this part. I knew where the soccer guys were going to live. So I scheduled – I found out, like, okay, they live on this building on this floor. I, I picked a room on that building on that floor in anticipation that I was going to make the team. Yeah. <laughs> And, and sure enough, it happened just like that. Like, I walked up to practice, and all the guys that were on my floor, you, Havo, Nino, uh, I think yeah. Trevor, some other guys, were at the practice. And then I just walked up and, you know, trained. And, uh, I mean, the rest is history, right? Spent four years on the team and loved every moment of it. But that's how it kind of went for college for me. You know what's crazy is that um... – <laughs> I remember you coming to me and, and, and saying, hey, you know, I'm actually going to try out. And I think, I think what happens is like um, when, you're playing, when you're playing like Division I <laughs> soccer or any sport, I think, and, and you see somebody who's a normal person, you know, and they tell you something like, oh, I want to come and, you know, like you just dismiss them in your head, you know. You're like, you're, you're like okay, yeah. Man. You really want to tell them, okay, just don't expect don't expect anything. Don't, don't think you can come and play with us, you know? Yeah. And, oh, uh, you, you were the one person that I was like, wow, okay, he can actually play, you know? And, and he, he actually did what he said he was going to do. I was so surprised. I, I, I was completely surprised. And, and I think it also speaks a lot to your, the amount of faith that you must have had. I mean... The fact that you, you know, you picked the room that was where the soccer guys stay, you know, you even, you went and spoke with the coach, you know, you waited for the child, you know, like, all of this is, is, is very naive, you know, but it's also the reason why, why you got the opportunity. And um, I don't know if you feel like that's common of, of, of footballers or people who aspire to do something um, or who have dreams like that. Is it common for them to have that kind of naivety? Man, I think that's a great question. For me, everything that's happened has always been that way. Like, I was so naive, didn't know enough. And then looking back on it, I just, you know, I was like, oh, why did I do it that way? But, man, sometimes it just works out. Like, you know, you kind of go in with this. I don't know what's going to happen, but I have a mindset that I'm going to get it done. And I just grinded it out and followed through with what I said I was going to do. And it worked out. And so I guess good things come from that. But oh, I was very, very naive. And uh, <laughs> it's kind of like a child, a childish naive, you know, they just, 
it's kind of like your little brother telling you that they're going to beat you and you kind of just laugh and you're like, man, that will never happen. And then they're suddenly good. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, so you play, little... you play three years and now you play, you play three or four years, three years. And, or are you? Yeah. Uh, four years ended up being all four years because another thing is I didn't know that you had to get NCAA cleared. I had no idea. So I show up <laughs> and then they're like, oh no, if you're not cleared, you can't play. And so by the time I got cleared, we were halfway through the season. I didn't want to use my eligibility. So I just told the coach, I was like, look, I'll just redshirt this year, and then I'll come back next year. And I'm not sure. I think – I know Havel for sure redshirted with me. I feel like you did too, but I, maybe you didn't. Um, I had eligibility issues. Okay. Oh, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> my, my, my thing is a whole other thing. But um, so you play these, you play the four years, and how were the four years for you? Uh, four years, amazing. Um, after I spent that first, honestly, I, I'm super glad that I didn't play that first year just because I don't think I would have been ready, like just physically and the what the sport demanded at that time. I was just not there, and so I took that year to really develop. And that summer, I put in a lot of work, and then come back that fall, which is my you know, my second year of school, but first year of playing the game. Um, way, I mean, and then from there on, I just was able to play four years back to back. And I'm super grateful that it happened that way because it gave me that year to adapt to um, the American style, the American uh, physicality, the running. Man, I, I just wasn't used to what it was um, in Mexico where I had grown up, it was a lot more technical and I was always one of the faster guys. And then I show up here and pff, guys are just blowing past me. And so it was just, and like, you know, they're just bigger and stronger. Um, Mexicans are just skinny and you can't ever get the ball away from them, but just a different game. And so I'm, I was grateful to have that year to adapt. And then, you know, four years in a row that I played and I loved every, I mean, every minute. And I think every year we got better. Uh, we had a coaching change the second year, and I think every year after that, by the time I finished, we were a better team than the year before. So it's, it's amazing. Yeah, and, and you managed – I mean, did you know that you have a Wikipedia page? <laughs> I found out. Yeah. <laughs> would, so your Wikipedia page? You <laughs> no, I, I didn't make it. Then. <laughs> I didn't make it. <laughs> but uh, – it says that you played 61 games for, for Roberts University, NCAA Division One. You scored 17 goals, yeah. which is quite a healthy return to, yeah, I, I would say you had a really good career, I would say. It's memorable by, by many people's standards. Yeah, and I think, I mean, there was, the reason we were so successful, obviously, I think a big part of it was the coaching. We had a, a coaching change from there, and then all the guys put in work, but we were, by the time we first got there, you and I, it, we were one of the worst teams in the country. I mean, that's what people don't understand looking at ORU now in the season that they had last year, which was top 25 in all NCAA. When we got there, we were, we were really 206 out of 206. I mean, the year before I looked at our stats, man, I think we won two or three games out of 17 uh, yeah. for ORU the year before we got there. And to put in, I think we just, kind of paved the way we put in some some work over our four years and then now the program four years out which is crazy because i graduated 2016 it's now four years out and the program is now top 25 and i think that's the things that you and i you know guys like Havo, nino the guys that kind of grinded it out we built kind of the foundation and now the house is being built so it's pretty cool to look back and see where it is and kind of where we took it from yeah, it's all because of us, man. <laughs> all the credit. We get all the credit. <laughs> that is crazy. So, so you, by the time you graduated from ORU, um, you, you, you're done playing. Um, what was, I mean, were you thinking, okay, now I want to go and play professionally? You know, I'm trying to, your final season, were you thinking, oh, I want, you know, I want to try and get into the draft? You know, what were you thinking? Yeah, so for me, it, it's kind of crazy how this played out. So at the time when I uh, finished my senior year, uh, most guys either the next month decide, hey, I'm going to apply for or get invited to the combine, do the draft, all that kind of stuff. Well, I was in a unique situation because I had started my master's degree um, 
because I had, like I said, I, my first year I didn't play. And so I had an extra year to work on my master's. And I was like, look, I could either, I was going to stay there five years regardless. So I was like, I can either get a normal degree in five years and kind of the last semester, it'd be a joke and take, you know, two classes, or I could yeah. do my master's and start it early, kind of the fast track program. And so I decided to do that. And so by the time I finished soccer, I was still missing one semester of grad school. It was December and I had to finish in May. And so I, I, it was really tough because I was like, look, I can either go play or pursue this. And after a couple of conversations with my family, um, nothing was for sure with the, the soccer side of it. And my dad, I mean, he didn't, he obviously didn't pressure me. It was my decision, but he really wanted me to finish because he was scared that if I didn't finish now, I wouldn't finish. And it's a pretty big accomplishment to get your master's. And so I made the decision to finish out that semester um, and then kind of go from there. And so that, I mean, that semester, even with no soccer, was the hardest semester of my life. I mean, just schooling and what I was trying to do to finish was super hard. But the summer hit and I was like, okay, now I'm done. Like, what do I want to do? You know, pro teams in the U.S. had just started in March. And so I was like, maybe I can still make it. And then, um, man, and then I got a job offer that I, I couldn't turn down. And I remember this, I remember this uh, specific conversation with my mom. I remember where I was in my room. And I called my mom and I was like, mom, like, I have this job or I can go play. I don't know what to do. And my mom has always been my biggest cheerleader. She's always told me, like, do, like, pursue your dreams. She's always been like, you can do it, pursue your dreams. But man, I was, I was in this space. I, I didn't know what would happen. You know, I had this, I had security. I have this job. They offered it to me. Very good job. Or, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. It's kind of out there. And so, I mean, I was 22 at the time. I ended up deciding to go uh, and take the job and kind of take the security. And so that summer I had off and then I started in August with this company um, here in town. I mean, it was Fantastic company, fantastic job. And so I took it and started working in August. Um, still kind of in the back of my mind thinking like, man, you know, I, I still had that itch to play. I was still playing uh, in Soccer City, indoor, outdoor, wherever I could find a field and guys that were playing, I would join. And um, so I started working, man. I, I, I went in and in August, I started working. And about six months in, the job was, I mean, it was great. Met tons of amazing people. Six months in, I uh, was with Havonino, some of my best friends, and they were like, hey, we're thinking about going to the World Cup. This is 20, this is 20, it was January of 2018. And the World Cup is in Moscow, in Russia, uh, the summer of 2018. And so yeah. they're like, hey, our parents, like, I think both of their dads were already going, and they're like, hey, we're thinking about going. And I was like, Man, that's that's been on my bucket list for years. I've always said I want to go to the World Cup. No matter, you know, I don't know where, but I'm going to the World Cup. Yeah. And so at the time, I was like, oh, I, I have to. And so in that month, I think we bought them in January, bought our tickets, go to the World Cup. And so even in like April and May, I was like, man, I have like, it kept like football kept on coming up, right? I was just like, I, my job. Run away from me. Man, I couldn't get away from it. I was like, the job is good, I'm, you know. I like where I'm at right now. I've been coaching as well um, with yeah. Westside Alliance here in town. So I was coaching. I was around the game. I was involved. But, man, I had this itch still, right? Well, then we go to the World Cup, right? So we go in June of 2018. And, I mean, one of the most amazing experiences of my life. I mean, un unbelievable. Uh, Habo, Nino, and myself were at the game that Mexico beat Germany 1-0. Uh, oh, in, that's... and they ended up Germany ended up obviously getting out but we were at the game and I mean I, I have videos and pictures but unbelievable experience to even witness that that made my whole trip worth it like to even be in the stadium to hear all these Mexicans wear the shirt and we beat Germany 1-0 I mean it was something I'll never forget <clears throat> and so uh, come back from that right I come back from uh Russia and the World Cup and I'm on a football high and I'm just like everything is football 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 and again I have a conversation with my family and I'm like guys I can't get away from it I have to I have to I, have to, yeah. I don't know what it's going to look like I don't know what is ahead of me but I have to try 
And yeah. so I got back in June, end of June. I put in my two weeks at my work about two weeks later. I, I still remember. I think it was July 9th. I put in my two weeks. I had nothing. I, I, don't, I don't even know what I was doing at the moment. But I had nothing planned. I had nothing ready. And I, I told yeah. my job, like, very good company, very good job. I was like, look, I'm leaving. <laughs> I, I don't even know why I did that. And they were like, okay. And it was tough because at the time they were trying to promote me. They wanted me to, to move to a different city and um, work for them as an account manager in the area. And I was really nervous because I was like, what kind, of, what kind, of, what kind of work were you doing? At, at, um, so at this I was doing sales. So the company is, it was called Hilti. They sell power tools for the construction industry. And so, so this is like a complete divorce from, I mean, you're not even involved in sports in terms of, you said you're still coaching, but like your main work is you went from like scoring goals to sitting in a desk, right? Yes. Yeah. So it was an eight to five job. The only, I was involved in the game with coaching and that was it, you know, I'd go from work, uh, finish there, go straight to the fields and coach. And then I would play either at night or on the weekends, right. Whenever I found time. Um, so yeah, the job, the job is a company, you know, had nothing to do with the sport in any way. Um, but great company regardless. Right. And so, uh, I, yeah, it, it becomes July and I put in my two weeks and I was just like, look, I told my boss I was nervous that they were going to be mad at me. I just told him, like, look, this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to play at a professional level. And I'm, I'm playing. <laughs> he must have looked at you like, yo, is this kid crazy? <laughs> there, was, there was one guy. It was cool. There was one of them that was like, there's kind of like one of my coworkers. He couldn't believe it. He could not believe it. He was like, so you've got no plan. You have no prospects. And you're leaving like a very good job. And I was like, yep, that's exactly what I'm doing. And then I talked to a boss. The boss was actually really encouraging. He was like, hey, when I was your age, I tried to play golf professionally, and I ended up leaving my job, um, and I would say go for it. So he was like, go for it. Other people were like, what are you doing? And I, I was like, it is what it is. I'm going to do it. And so I put in my two weeks. And funny, man, the two weeks later, end of July, I, that Friday, I think it was, the, it was either the 29th or the 30th, uh, July of 2018, it was that Friday I put in, was my last day at work, right? I'm saying goodbye to everybody. Um, and on Saturday, okay, so Saturday morning, I um, sent a message to a buddy that had ties to the club here in town, that's also Roughnecks at the time. I said, hey, I'm trying to play at a pro level. Is there any way that I can come on trial for the club? Yeah. Doesn't answer all day Saturday. Sunday, I think, evening. Okay? This is – my last day was Friday. I've got nothing ahead of me. I've just been working out training by myself. But, you know, that's no, nothing compared to actual team training. On cool. Sunday evening, I get a message from him. He says, yes, you're welcome to come. Here's our schedule for the week. So wow. I go from Friday sitting in an office to Monday. I showed up at the fields. Training, oh training, and just just the new guy. Just show up kind of really similar to how it was at ORU. Everybody had already been training. They're, they start their season in, in March, and I show up in July, right? So everybody already knows each other, and I'm just, I just show up. And the funny thing they're is all, – They're all fit. They're all – I mean, they've been playing. You were coming from an office. They had, a, they had a game that Saturday. So this is Monday. They had a game Saturday. So they've been in season, right? They've been playing games. And I didn't, because I didn't know when I was going to get that message to show up on Sunday, I had a Sunday league game. And after the game, it was like a final, it was like a kind of a big deal for Sunday league. After the game, I was like, oh man, I, I need to get more fitness in. So <laughs> I go run the full field about like 12 times, like after the game. And I was just like, no, like that's not good enough. I need more fitness. I go run like sprints up and down. Yeah. Okay. And then he tells me the next day, he's like, Sunday night, he's like, show up tomorrow. So I show up, man. I am so sore. I can barely move. And I'm showing up to a pro session. And I've never played, like, I've played at a high level, but never at a pro level. And I show up, sore. Man, I get there. First thing they say, everybody get on the line. <laughs> oh, Jesus, man. <laughs> they go, they go, if you played, if you played more than, I think, 60 or 65 minutes on Saturday, you're good. Go do recovery. 
Everybody else, get on the line. We're doing fitness. Man, I, I, I'm, I'm like, what? Like, I am dying. But, I mean, it was really, really funny looking back on it. But sure enough, man, they put us on the line and we did fitness. And I did, I did all right. I, I stayed up as much as I could yeah. about middle, middle of the pack. And then we ran through a whole session the rest of the day. And then kind of my story is that I spent two months on trial. So going every day for two months and honestly did pretty well. Uh, level was good, but you know how when you're playing with good players, you get better. And so yeah. what was that for me? It was like, man, it's high level, but I don't feel like I'm anywhere, you know, way. Sometimes, you know, like, okay, the level's too high for me or the level's way too low here. I was like, man, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of here. I'm kind of sticking with them. And so yeah. ended uh, because you had played at a high level, so it's probably just a matter of adapting to, to yeah. you know, older guys, you know, bigger bodies, that kind of thing. Yeah, and the difference was that it had been about two years since I had played like at a competitive level because college ended in sixteen, and this is eighteen, right? And so I had just done like for all seventeen, I just played Sunday league, and you know, not at a super high level, and so that took a second to adapt because it had been a year or a year and a half um, between um, me playing in college and then pro. And so anyway, uh, if you fast forward the story, I couldn't sign then because the season was ending and they just didn't have spots open. But I talked with the coach and he was like, look, you've done well. Um, we're looking to sign you for next year. And then if you fast forward January of next year is when I finally got signed. So it was kind of crazy. And then the whole pro season started that is a hell of a testimony man because most guys can't even get the two the two months that you got yeah you know you guys yeah. can't even get that and 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 there you were like <laughs> it's so funny that you were playing the day before and then it's like hey come tomorrow <laughs> it, it honestly feels god sent. like it feels yeah. like there was some divine intervention that got you that kind of opportunity because I, I mean, you just when you're in the US, you just know how many guys who are playing college soccer are trying to actually just get that. You know, even even just one week. You know, yeah. there's so many players from all these divisions, and and that is just that is that is one hell of a testimony, man. Yeah. <laughs> so it it was it was funny how it happened. It's it's just like the chips fell at the right moment because that's how it was just a god thing. Because at the time, the team wasn't doing great. And they had some injuries and they needed guys to fill in. And I was, you know, I was just on the sidelines. You know, you're the last one to get picked for anything. But I was just like, look, I'll do whatever you need. And so that's actually how I became a right back. Because I hadn't played right back my entire, my whole life. Never once had yeah. played right or left back. And that's where they needed me. They're like, look, go play right back. Like, that's where we need you. And, you know, I was like, yep, no problem. I'll, I'll be there. And so I showed up and I did that for two months. And then that's where the coach saw me, and then he recruited me as a right back, and that's how I became a defender. <laughs> how how did you deal with? Um, I think something that that you that you mentioned is that there was the security, and then there was the uncertainty. And the first time you chose the security, but then you went into the uncertainty. How did you? Um, first of all, many people don't know that side of football. You know, they they don't picture it as being that uncertain. You mm -hmm. know. Um, but how did you deal with the uncertainty? Uh, I had I had really really good people around me and like people that I trusted that gave me good advice because yeah man it was it was very tough like those three months where I was on trial every day was man that was a bad session or that was a really good session I remember two or three like really good sessions I was very very top I was getting back into it. And then the next week I would have a terrible session and I was just like, man, this guy's never going to sign me. You know, you're always thinking like, is the, you know, the coach looking all that kind of stuff. And really my family and the people around me, the ones that got me through it, they were like, look, just keep going. He's going to notice you. Um, funny story is the coach didn't talk to me until about a month after. Like I shook his hand the first day, told him my name, and then he never talked to me after, which makes sense. He's dealing with, he's dealing with, you know, 20 odd players and trying to win games, but never once like spoke to me or, you know, even talk, asked me where I was from or anything like that. And it took about a month until we finally maybe had one conversation. And then two months passed, three months, or it was like two and a half months that I was on trial. And then finally, you know, like the breakthrough, but man, the uncertainty of 
is this guy just going to kick me out and never want me back? It was tough, but I had people around me that encouraged me, and they're like, look, keep doing it. You know, you know what you need to do. You know you're at the level. Like you've been there for a month. You're good enough to be there. Just keep going. Keep grinding it out. Um, but it was tough, man, not knowing at any moment if he could – be like, don't come back. <laughs> man, you live on the edge a little bit, but sometimes that's just the pro lifestyle. That, in in a way, it's, it sounds bad, but in a way, you are just a number. Um, and not everybody can, you know, lives like that or coaches like that. But man, it is very cutthroat, and the industry is very, very cutthroat. And people from the outside, you don't think about that. You don't think that at one moment you rolled an ankle uh, in a practice, and then you sit on the sidelines for three months. And you might never hit the field again because the next guy came in and took over. Um, yeah. it's, it's tough. It, it, there's, there's a very um, – every day is you go in there trying to be your best and um, things can change quick. So Yeah. What, what, what do you feel is, is some of the differences that you experience between playing at the college level and playing at the professional level? Yeah. Biggest things for sure speed of play ball moved way quicker in pro and it forced me um i mean even the rondos you get there you start doing the rondos ball is moving everybody there's no there's no bad touches um in in college you can you know there might be a two or three pass sequence that it kind of breaks down takes longer to get there but at that level if, if you're breaking it down and if you're not there it it will find you out like you're doing a yeah. pass you keep messing it up like you will just Everybody will know you're messing it up. You know, it just it finds your touch finds itself. You know, you everybody finds out that you're the one screwing it up. Um, and so, man, you had to constantly like the speed of play was just the ball had to be moving at a much quicker level. Um, that for sure, uh, the sessions were way harder for a pro. Like they, every session was I'm giving 100. percent In college, you can kind of like you'll have a couple sessions where you're and you're younger, right? So you think you're the you know you're the big name on campus. I'm, I'm a college soccer player. Right? I'm kind of cool, blah blah blah. But uh, so you might go through a session at seventy percent, but you do that there, you're gone. Like yeah. it, is, it is so cutthroat in that sense that you need to show up every single day, um, and that comes with the physicality. Like you're not there, guys are running past you. Like it'll find out. Like the coach will see, and then that could cost you. I remember there was one practice. Uh, we we switched to a different formation, and I was playing a wing back. And then my fitness was good, but it wasn't where he wanted it because he wanted guys flying up and down. And then I was yeah. sucking wind. I was, <sighs> and uh, about <laughs> ten minutes into the scrimmage, she just subbed me. She's like, "Get out! Like, get the next guy in," because I just couldn't keep up. Uh, so that was that was rough, man. You you just know that like. Because in college that doesn't really happen, you know. You're like, oh, I'm the starter. You kind of, you kind of walk around. No one's gonna take my spot, man. Yeah. Different. It's different at that level. Because um, ultimately, it's a results-based business. You know, you got to win. Uh, yeah. College is a little bit less that mindset. You're kind of there for the experience and to have fun. And if you lose 15 games, it's yeah, that kind of sucks for us. But I still have a spot on the team next year, right? Yeah. College. Yeah. But, have a scholarship to have. And pro man, you don't you don't win. You're not going to be there. So <laughs> yeah, that makes it that makes it extremely difficult. I feel like a lot of guys don't they don't see that side. I think I uh, maybe even you were the same. You know, you finish. You've never really had the exposure to how cutthroat the the industry is mm-hmm. until you're in it, and then it's like, oh, this thing is hard. This is um, this is really really hard. Mm-hmm. Um, and you've just described one of those moments that you had where you were like, okay, this is, this is hard. Is there another one of those moments that you had where you were like, okay, this is, this is not, this is hard. Ooh, good question. Uh, there, yeah, I can't think of one. Uh, there was a time that I had, um, our season was up and down, right? We started off really, really strong. We were at the top, and then some things happened. We started going down, started losing games, right? And at the mm-hmm. beginning, I hadn't gotten a chance, man, not even a sniff. I wasn't a starter. Uh, sometimes I would make the top 18, 
But there's 26 guys, 27 guys on the team, right? And on game day, only 18 suit up. So you can be on the team and sitting and watching the game, just the way it is, right? And so for the first, I don't know how many games, I didn't even make the 18. Like, that was tough. Like, I felt like I was there, didn't make the 18. But slowly, as the season went on, I improved, started making the 18. Eventually, um, started getting starts and started getting playing time. Well, there was a time at the end of the season I had played, I think, three games in a row. But we had um, – no, no, no. I'm getting it wrong. I had not played three games in a row, but we were on a losing streak. And we went on a really bad losing streak. Like in my whole soccer career, the most games in a row that we had lost or tied, we just hadn't, couldn't find a win. Like just couldn't find a win. It was weird. We would be winning and then they would tie us in the 89th minute and we would like either tie or lose. Like games like that, you know, you're just like, why cannot we not win? Well, a game that I started right, right around then where we hadn't won yet, I started and I played the full game and we won. Our first win, and I think, man, I think it was almost a month, a month and a half, maybe more. Yeah. And we won at home. And, I mean, amazing time, amazing experience. One of the best for me the whole season to start and play that full game and to win. Like, just the feeling after not winning so many games to win. Well, ended up the next week, I didn't even travel. <laughs> didn't even, I don't uh. know. That's one of the things I think I'll wonder for a very long time is, we win the game, played the full game, had a great game, and then the next the next week we had an away game and I didn't travel. And man, you just you just like all that self doubt comes in and you start questioning everything and you kind of try to see it from a coaching perspective, like okay, he wants these players or this is what he's looking for, but man, that that stuff will hit you hard, right? And you're just like, I've done so much. I feel like I've established myself on the field in the for sure in the 18 in the starting 11 and then it just changes in a moment right just like I was saying earlier things can change so quick so that was a tough moment for me definitely one that um you know kept me up at night for for a couple weeks um but like anything you kind of grind through it right you got to keep showing up every single day two hours I'm going to grind and give the best this practice and keep my head up but yeah not see what happens behind the scenes that can really be really tough. What do you think was different or what do you think is different about you? If you were to credit yourself somehow with um, maybe there's, there's things that you do differently or there's something that's different about you that has gotten you where you are, what would you say are those things? Or do you feel like you're just the same as everyone else? Because I, I feel like your journey is not normal. It, it's not yeah. it's not the conventional kind of thing. And mm -hmm. there's definitely some things that you that you're doing right or some things that you do that maybe most people don't do. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great question. For me specifically, I think it's my mindset. I I'm very linear. You know, I very I very much like to see things like, okay. This can happen, this can happen, this can happen, all on the same uh, line. And so even for when I look back for college and for pro, I basically I kind of analyzed everything. I saw, okay, these guys are good enough to play pro, and I would see them play, and I'd be like, I think I'm good enough. There was a time before I quit my job that I went to a game. I showed up to the stadium, and I watched the game, and I thought, if I do these certain things, I can make this. These guys are not way above my level. I can play at this level. And so um, I just went back to the drawing board and I was like, this is what I need to do to make it to the pro level. This is what needs to happen. And I drew it out and then I did it. But my mindset the whole time was that I'm going to make it. Like I just, it was kind of one of those things where I just knew the same way that I knew I was going to play college soccer as an 18 year old that didn't know what it looked like. I just knew I was going to play. And when I looked at college, or pro sports, pro soccer in the U.S., I was like, I, I just knew it was going to happen. I knew it was going to, I could make it. And so my mindset was that no matter what, when I'm, even if, even if they had said no at, in Tulsa, like if they were like, no, we don't want you, I knew I would have made it somewhere else. I just, my mindset was that I don't care what everybody's going to say to me. Like, I'm going to make it. I know that I'm good enough to make it. And I believed in myself. And yeah. what happened in Tulsa, I'm glad they took me here. Because uh, it would have been tough to move away, but um, it happened the way it happened. But some guys, they lack a little bit of that belief. They think, you know, ah, I don't know, maybe I can make it. I, I remember talking to one guy, 
and he was kind of in the same boat. He was on trial, and I was like, look, are you, like, really trying to play? He was like, yeah, I don't know, like, maybe. Um, that, you know, I don't really know yet. And I was like, man, you don't, you don't just accidentally become a pro. Like, you don't just wake up and, like, it just happens. You know, like, you have to, like, commit to it. You have to make that decision. And he wasn't willing to do it and then ended up not making it. And for me, there was no, there was no plan B. There was no, it was a hundred or nothing. Like, I mean, I'm doing all, uh, some guys want to do that, but not, not commit fully to it. Their mindset's a little off. Yeah. So was the mindset and was there anything else you feel that made you, made you special in any way or makes you special? No. Um, That's the main thing. I mean, between those two things and then just the grind, like the day in, day out, what it takes to actually play at that level, some guys aren't willing to do. And so um, I believed in myself and I just grinded it out because um, there was times where uh, like I halfway through our, my trial, I'm just like, I'm like these mental, you know, things start coming that, okay, if he doesn't offer me, where am I going to go next? What's going to happen? But then I have to be like, no, like grind it out, show up here, be where I'm at, like be present and keep going kind of like pushing through that wall. Cause always the, you know, yeah. you, you resistance and it's pretty easy to give up, but to keep going, that's just a, takes a different animal, you know, it takes a different person to persevere and hit those walls and keep going. Um, so I just grinded it out. Really, if I had to look back, that's just what I did. I just grinded it out. <laughs> if you were to change, cause I know, I know there's several things, and like you were saying earlier, that you did terribly wrong. You know, <laughs> yeah. is there anything that you you would change about the whole experience? Is there something that you've always thought, oh man, you know, if I could go back and change that, the one thing I would change it. Honestly, and I, and I mean this honestly, I don't think so. I think I, I really I really laugh at my own story because I laugh at myself and how naive I was. But <laughs> I, I love the way I did it. You know, I, I walked on to a college program that I had no business being on. And then I just kind of basically did that pro too. I just walked on and I, I did what I did. <laughs> but some people, because someone asked me too, they're like, well, do you wish that you had not gone and worked in between? And I was like, no, like, I'm, I'm glad I did. Um, I'm glad that that's the way it played out for me because it could have been different. I could have just gone and, or I couldn't even finish to grad school. You know, I could have decided to try to go play after grad school, but man, I'm glad it happened the way it happened. And I don't think I would have changed it. Um, I think, <laughs> I think maybe little things, uh, you know, that, that were really dumb that I did, but ultimately how the story played out. Um, I really don't think I would change anything. I think I'd just keep it. Yeah, that's that's a beautiful thing, man. Because, uh, man, to to because now that you've seen both sides, I'm sure you valued the whole experience so much more. You know, you had been at a desk, and mm -hmm. you know, felt like you know, there's something missing. Like mm -hmm. I'm, I know this thing is calling me, and then to go from the, you you had seen that side at least. You know, a lot of guys who, who want to play football, they've never seen that side before. They don't know how it feels until they're in it. Then it's like, oh man, actually football was was much more fun than this. You know, at least that's how I'm imagining it in in my head. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What would you say to guys who are maybe younger or aspiring players um, that that want to play at the level you've played at? Uh, I I tell every single person. Because a lot of people have asked me this, you know, when we were with the, the Roughnecks, we would go to school assemblies or do community events, and they would often ask us, you know, um, kind of the same question. And I, what I always tell kids from whatever age, if they're in middle school, high school, aspiring to play pro, I always tell them to go for it. Because I've seen too many people be scared and either, either their parents or their coaches even tell them, like, you can't do that or like don't don't pursue that or don't do that but i i truly believe that you really can do what you set your mind to and so my biggest advice whenever they ask me like should i go for it i'm like yes go for it like if you have that passion inside of you if you have that drive and you want to play 
go for it. At least take the jump, man. I'm, I would have been so much more frustrated with myself if I had just stayed in my job and stayed comfortable and never even once jumped out and been like, I'm just going to do it. Like, I'm, yeah. I'm just satisfied that I even, like, even if I didn't make it, I mean, I was obviously very grateful that I did, but even if I didn't, I would have been like, at least I had, you know, the courage to do that instead of sitting in a job. Yeah. That, and it was, it was a good job, but that I knew that I wanted something different. Um, so man, I always tell them like, do, do what you want to do. It may not be football. It might not be whatever, but do that thing that you want to do. And if you fail, at least you learn from it. I was reading a book this week and it talks about, there's, there's different kinds of like knowing things. Like you can know something by reading about it. Like I can know, um, how to ride a bike. If I can read about, okay, you need to pedal and you need to push off and all these kinds of things but I don't really know how to ride a bike until I experience it, right? Like you experience something, that's when you can tell something and you can translate being like, hey, does anybody know, or do you know how to ride a bike? And if I've done it, I can teach them and walk them through it. But I can't do that unless I've experienced it. And a lot of those kids that whatever they want to do, they need to go out and experience it. And even if they get it wrong, and if they fail, to know that experience. And now I have, I can talk to people that want to go pro and I can be like, look, this is, this is what I went through. This is what you can expect. But if they're not courageous enough to even try it, man, it, it, it's, it's not a, I mean, I kind of see it as like a tragedy. It's not really a tragedy. There's worse things that can happen to you, right? There's worse things in life, but, um, man, to never kind of go on that adventure and to never jump off the ledge for like a second, it's something that I think a lot of people can look back on and say, I wish I would have done that differently. Um, yeah, you have so many what ifs in your head. And I, I feel like, I'm, I'm, I'm similar to you in the sense that I can't live with what ifs, you know. If, if, if you feel so much worse when you don't try something. You'll always be asking. Like if you had gone to, that, to the game that you watched, you know, before you actually went for the trial, if you had gone to that game and you're like, yo, I can play here, you know. But if you had never tried, you'd always go to every, you know, you may even go to another game and, and you're just like, man, I, I should have tried, you know. Until yeah. you're 36 and it's like, yo, I should have tried this. Yeah, I didn't try. The always I would have been like, man, what if I tried, you know? And I would have had that doubt in, deep inside of me. But now I don't. Now, even if I never sign another contract, right? If I if no one ever offers me another one, I have that satisfaction to like, man, I did it. Like, I yeah, can say I was a pro soccer player. You know, I can say that I did those things because I, I just did. I just made that leap. But, man, it would kill me to look back and be like, I never tried. And that's yeah. what, man, people – you got to kind of count the cost. A lot of people, for them, it's not worth it. Um, they want to have that security, but something deep inside of them, like it was for me, that was like, you have to try this. You have to go for it. Yeah. Is there anything, if you were in my position, you would ask yourself? Um, oof, that's a good question. Uh, I have a couple of good questions, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like you've done that before. Uh, that's really good uh i think something important for for me to say for those that are are listening is that there's it, it's not all and we've kind of talked about it through this whole thing in the last hour but it's not all the sunshine and rainbows like it's not all um we see a lot of times the, the things on Instagram, the awesome posts at the times that everything is kind of going great, but we don't see the backside, you know, of you going through what you have to go through to get there. And whether that be like for your body, if you're trying to play sports financially with whatever you're doing, like, man, there's, there's the dark dates. Like I wouldn't say that every moment that I was playing the last year were man, fantastic moments, but the one of the greatest things for me and that I I would take is that I was able to be I was able to live in the moment and I was able to be like grateful through the moment. And what I mean by that is that there were days I would finish training and I would just look up at the heavens and I would just thank God for what what was created in front of me. Like obviously I put a lot of work into it, but ultimately like God led me and got me to where I was and I was just grateful and I was just thankful to be there. You know, even if I think at the time I wasn't even playing, like I wasn't even on the field. I was just grateful to be there. 
and I lived in the moment. I took it in. Um, and a lot of times we don't do that. We kind of see all the sunshine and rainbows, but even in, during the bad stuff, even when um, there were times, like for months I didn't play, I was able to be present and like give thanks for the moment and just like be grateful. And like, man, that'll humble you. Um, but wherever kids are or wherever, what they're going through, like, hey, I want to be pro. I'm not there yet. Like, look, man, like, you're you're where you are right now. You're playing academy. Like, be grateful for this moment. Live in this moment where you are now. I know it's not where you want to be, but live in this moment now. And once I did that and I really took it in, it changed my whole perspective. I didn't look at it as, man, I'm not playing. I don't – the coach doesn't even look at me. This sucks. Like, I mean, I was just like, look, I'm even grateful to be here. Six months ago, I was sitting at a desk, man. So today, I got to wake up, eat two eggs, protein shake, and then go out to the field and play the sport that I love for two hours. Changes yeah. your life, honestly. And so, um, man, if I could have kids realize that, even in the dark days, just be grateful and live in the moment, you ultimately realize that, yeah, your goals are important, but what really matters is kind of how what you're living in the present, right? So that's kind of what I took from it. You have a beautiful testimony, man. Yeah, I, I think, <laughs> like, uh, wow. Uh, you've inspired me, man. You really have. <laughs> even from afar, because um, even just seeing, just seeing your progression from where you were to where you are now, um, just know that in, in my mind and in the mind of, I'm sure, many people who, who, are, who are watching this um, or who are going to watch this, you've succeeded, man. Like, you are, you don't need to reach the top of, of any mountain because I, I feel like you're already there because um, you're a big inspiration to many people. And I want you to, to know that. Thanks, Kimbo. That means a lot. <laughs> for the days when you when you're doubting that you know because i know that those days do come yeah those come those days come man they're real but not a bad thing you know yeah so thank you matthew thank you for being with us on bigger than football um thank you for sharing your story thank you for for just being open about it and we at True Talents of Africa, we just want to wish you the best. Um, and we'll be following from afar. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to see what's next for you. Um, and thank you, man. Just really appreciate it. Man, thanks for having me. This was awesome. It was, uh, I, you know, you never really expect what's going to happen through it all. But it's cool for me, too. I just kind of relive a lot of, kind of take a moment and pause and you go, man, what has happened in the last two years? And uh, it's really cool. I really enjoyed it. And so hopefully um, I can inspire somebody else and somebody else that's listening can, can take it and decide what they want to do, um, kind of change a little bit of what, what their plan was. Um, but thanks for having me, man. This is awesome. It's awesome to catch up. Um, and I'll be following you guys too, for sure, in the near future. No problem, man. Cheers. All right. Cheers. Okay, you don't have to cut the call. I'm just gonna turn off the the recording button. <laughs> I was like, I wait.